Okay, thank you very much. And uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, Oncology Club uh, Bangladesh and also Dr. Kamal Udin for giving me this opportunity to be part of this event and deliver a lecture on planning techniques and plan evaluation. The topic uh, that has been given to me is uh, planning techniques and plan evaluation. And uh, planning techniques, I have to cover 2D, 3D, IMRT, and VMAT. So that's a wide topic. So what I have decided is that on planning techniques, I will just cover in three or four slides, and then I will elaborate more on plan evaluation. Uh, to start with, uh, in uh, conventional 2D planning, we always use a very simple field setup. And uh, just let me select uh, laser pointer. And the field, uh, fields are normally shaped according to the bony anatomy or according to the tumor contrast that we see on uh, orthogonal simulator films or on a representative CT scan. We don't make any serious attempt to shape the fields. Uh, at the most, we just place uh, some non-divergent uh, blocks and we always use only jaws. And for planning, we either use manual point dose calculation or we use printed isodose charts. And the treatment planning systems, if at all they are used, they always used only lookup tables for calculating the dose distribution in simple 2D plane. And that's how we did the 2D planning using uh, simulator films and external skin markings and the fields drawn on the simulator films. And uh, we used such type of uh, contouring device external body contour uh, drawing device. It's hard to believe uh, for young people to know that such devices existed, but uh, I myself, I have used such type of devices at one point of time. And then we place the printed charts on these uh, external body contours and go on to compute the uh, dose distribution in a single plane. Coming to the 3D planning, the 3D model of the patient uh, is uh, created with the help of the CT scans and often we take the help of um, multiple imaging modalities to build this model and we go on to contour uh, the target and as well as the organ at risk volumes according to the concepts that are defined in ICRU 50 and ICRU 62. We use often three or more number of fields and all fields are placed according to the beams I view and they are all shaped using MLC, extensively shaped using the multi-leaf collimators. The 3D dose calculation is calculated in the planning system using model-based algorithms. We have uh, come a long way from the lookup table-based algorithms, and we have got uh, better tools for plan evaluation in these uh, planning systems, like uh, maximum dose, and the dose distribution we can see in isodose lines format or dose cloud or in color wash, et cetera. And also like dose cloud and also in 3D view. And also dose volume histograms are present in these planning systems. When we come to, when we, uh, when we talk about intensity modulated radiation therapy, IMRT, the workflow remains more or less same as we had seen in 3D CRT. The workflow for the IMRT remains more or less same uh, like in 3D CRT. The only differences are that, uh, that we have to do a lot more contouring of the normal structures and we have to use more number of uh, MLC fields. But in these MLC fields, gantry will remain static, but MLCs will either remain static or they will move at the time of radiation on. And most important difference is that we used an inverse planning approach. Instead of placing the fields and calculating the toes, the field, how they are to be intensity modulated, they are reverse calculated in order to meet the dose constraints we go on to define for the target volumes and the organs at risk. There are multiple delivery techniques that are commercially available for delivering such intensity. In intensity modulated arc therapy, that is IMAT, the correct terminology is the IMAT. Uh, most often we use volumetric modulated arc therapy. Uh, the general concept and the process for uh, this IMAT is not much different from IMRT. 
the only thing is that the gantry moves as against the IMRT where the gantry remains static, the gantry moves, MLCs move, and the, the dose rate is also varied when the radiation is on. And in order to achieve the dose constraints, the aperture shape variations are used. And in addition to aperture shape variation, dose rates uh, are also, dose rate is also varied. The techniques can differ, the nomenclatures can vary, but the underlying principles remain the same. That is, in order to achieve the dose constraints, the aperture shapes are varied and the dose rate is varied. Uh, the IMAT uh, plan is computationally difficult because in IMAT we are opening more degrees of freedom and because of that, uh, the calculation is difficult uh, to uh, computationally difficult. Yeah. And the people who want to know more about uh, the VMAT, uh, I would strongly recommend to refer to this particular review paper, the intensity modulated dark therapy that appeared in Physics and Medicine and Biology way back in 2011 as an excellent paper that, that talks, talks about uh, the different uh, techniques and uh, how, uh, uh, how actually VMAT is carried out. Now coming to the second part of the, the presentation, that is the plan evaluation. And plan evaluation, uh, what we mean by plan evaluation is uh, we are going to assess the plan quality. That is the dose distribution that is realistically achievable for a plan that we have developed. We are going to see whether that is clinically suitable for delivering to a patient or not. And that is what we call it as the plan evaluation. And it has got three components to it. Uh, using the dose metrics, we evaluate the plan. And also we go on to check uh, the robustness of the plan and how complex it is. So these are the three different aspects of uh, plan evaluation. Now, plan evaluation is a key step in the process uh, of uh, RT treatment delivery. If you look at the AAPM task report, task group report 100, it uh, gives us the, the number of failure modes in each of the different steps in the RT treatment delivery process. And if you look at uh, that table, we can find that nearly one third of the total number of failure modes occur at the stage of treatment planning and plan approval. So if we have to prevent these failure modes from propagating and reaching the patient, then plan evaluation gives us one last chance to identify and uh, stop them from propagating further. That is why plan evaluation remains a key step in the RT treatment uh, delivery chain. So how do we do that? Uh, the most important requirement is that uh, we have to standardize the entire process of uh, treatment planning. Avoid personal preferences completely and reduce the subjectivity as much as possible and we should see to that that there is no interplanar variability involved. From planner to planner, there shall not be variability. Everybody should follow the standard practice. How do we achieve that? Go on to define institutional protocols that can help in standardizing the planning approaches, how we do planning for different patients, different sites in the standard way. Develop institutional protocols and try to use class solutions in treatment planning. And uh, for that, like for example, the institutional protocols that you develop uh, should uh, give solutions for what kind of uh, criterion that you are going to use for the PTB coverage. Is it 95% of the prescription dose shall cover 100% of the PTB or 100% of prescription dose shall cover at least 95% of PTB or is it 95% of prescription dose shall cover at least 95% of PTB? Which criterion are you going to use for PTB coverage? DBH criteria for OARs, and then also the protocol should have the answers for questions like what if the criteria are not met with? So everything should be clearly mentioned in the protocol so that everything can be standardized. Pay attention to the normalization. That is another important point where the things can go wrong. 
For example, medical physicist after developing a plan tells that uh, tells the radiation oncologist, see, I have developed a plan in which 92% is covering 100% of the PTV. So what we can do is that uh, uh, according to our clinical protocol, we want 95% shall cover 100% of the PTV. So let's do one thing. Let us renormalize 97% to 100%. And now in that case, 95% will cover 100% of the PTV, which is our requirement. Well, the only thing is that the dose maximum, which is now 105%, it will become 108% after renormalization. Is this okay? Now the physician will definitely get confused. He would say that all I want is that 95% of the prescription dose should cover 100% of the PTV because they are in two different uh, worlds. So if you have to standardize everything, the planning approach, you have to be on the same platform. For physicist, when he says 100%, uh, what he means is 100% is at the normalization point. For physician, it is the prescription dose that is 100%. Both should talk the same language. Both should be on the same platform. As long as the dose is prescribed at the plan normalization point, there is no issue at all. But when it is not, then one has to be careful. This is the issue that lies in dealing with the normalization. So what is the solution? The solution is that always evaluate the plan in absolute dose mode, centigrade. Please remember that the plan evaluation is never complete without the dose being displayed in the absolute dose mode, that is in centigrade mode. And also understand the interplay in your TPS. All of the people involved in the plan evaluation should know how the TPS is handling the normalization. The isocenter, the plan reference point, the beam weight, the normalization point or method, the reported and recorded dose, all of these have got a strong interplay between them. And they're all unique to every treatment planning system. We cannot say that this is how we have to do because each planning system handles all these concepts in different way in using different terminologies. So understand their relationship, their effect on the dose distribution, the dose volume histogram, the MU calculation and on how they affect the, the dose reporting. And also have a look at the location of the point used in the MU calculation. That is very critical because you have to do second check mechanism and that point uh, should be uh, at the correct uh, location. The issue here is that if there are large differences, they will reflect as very large MUs or very too few MUs. So they are easy to note, but subtle differences, they can go undetected patient after patient uh, resulting in a systematic error, which is a very serious thing. And one another thing that I would recommend, which I personally personally prefer is that to take a time out process before uh, starting with the plan evaluation. That is ask questions like, is it the correct image set that has been used in this particular plan? It is particularly important when there are multiple image sets for that patient, adaptive plan has been done for the patient, or phase two, phase three, or re-radiation, the patient is coming after a couple of months or a couple of years for re-radiation. So in that type of circumstances, you have to use a standard nomenclature. Follow a standard nomenclature system to avoid mistakes for everything, for contours. And then when physicists develop their own contours for the optimization purposes, put them in the last by adding a character Z at the beginning. And then like FP1, final plan one for the plan name, CCT for the uh, image data set, thorax, uh, CT, and FP1 for the plan name, R1 stands for uh, when the patient comes for re-radiation. And also have a check on whether the scanning volume is sufficient enough or not. Is the body contour complete without the holes? Is the contouring complete with all relevant OARs or have you missed out some OARs? Are all the contours correct and consistent? If you happen to uh, alter the contours after the plan has been done, that's not a good uh, uh, signal. That's not a good sign for the treatment planning process in your clinic. So where the editing of the contours after the planning has been done should, uh, should not be uh, there. And the planner should apprise the radiation oncologist about the results of the fusion and what were the limitations or what kind of uh, errors are possible in the results of uh, in the fusion results. 
he should tell the radiation oncologist about that to check on the dose calculation grid whether the size of the dose calculation grid is uh, appropriate or not and what kind of resolution uh, has has been used dose calculation algorithm if the planning system has got more than one algorithm whether the correct algorithm has been uh, used and inhomogeneity correction if applicable whether it is on or off and whether the uh, planning system generated any warning message in the plan printout if so whether that will have an effect on the dose distribution or not everything have a check and now coming to the plan evaluation it starts with the uh, uh, narration of uh, the what has been done by the planner so the planner has to tell uh, to the radiation oncologist first of all i uh, personally prefer that everyone should involved should be present at the time of plan evaluation it's not that you do the plan and then uh, send it across to uh, a radiation oncologist sitting far away so at the time of plan evaluation everybody involved should be present uh, to physically present to evaluate the plan then planner should apprise the radiation oncologist about the plan like uh, what is the total dose number of fractions dose per fraction what is the technique that he has used uh, what energy has been used now how many number of fields and their brief description say like uh, partial arc or single arc or dual arcs is it full arc uh, things like that and how many number of isocenters has been used in the plan and uh, what is the hot spot and what is its uh, magnitude and coverage everything the planner should uh, uh, tell before actually go on, going on to the uh, evaluation so the evaluation start with looking at the dose metrics different dose metrics uh, first to have a look at the global dose maximum because it happens to be a quick eliminator if it is too high say like in the excess of 110% then plan most likely is not going to be acceptable but when we say that what is the uh, global dose maximum if you are using a monte carlo system then it has got its own challenges in terms of uncertainty because uh, global dose maximum will be hardly in one or two few voxels and uh, only when one or two voxels uncertainty associated in that dose calculation is high and similarly even in interpreting maximum doses to serial organs at risk also Uh, it has got certain amount of uncertainty associated with that so you need to know more about how your planning system handles the uncertainty what is more important is that the location of this dose maximum should be assessed and it must certainly be inside the ctv this global dose maximum and it preferably it should be within the gtv and never close to any organs at risk or in the periphery of the ptv take time to evaluate this global dose maximum perhaps by using different tools like dose banding and to find out where it is located dose matrix has got two aspects to it a qualitative aspect and quantitative aspect a qualitative you just to scroll through axial and other major planes and then you look at use the different display modes and tools that are available in the planning system to see the dose distribution how it looks like in quantitative you use tools like uh, dose volume histogram plan matrix like uh, uh, uniformity index uh, het heterogeneity index uh, conformity index and conformity number dose display tools there are lot many tools that are available in uh, many planning systems uh, dose banding is a highly useful tool so what i mean by dose banding is that uh, here you are seeing the dose distribution in a color shade or color was and that is limited only between 95 and 107.8 so it's a very highly useful tool but the only problem is that it can be highly misleading one too because one may be tempted to accept a plan far too quick by looking at a dose distribution like this you may be tempted to accept this plan far too quick without much evaluating but important thing is that you have to always look at lower isodose values like 70% 50% 25% to go down even up to 5% dose levels also before you accept a plan and it is especially important if you are using a non coplanar setup if you are using a non coplanar setup please do not forget to, to look at the lower isodose values in coronal and as well as sagittal planes it is a must when you you are using non coplanar setup 
Coming to the dose volume histogram, dose volume histograms uh, is a very useful tool because it is going to collapse the 3D information, which may be difficult to comprehend or uh, to completely assimilate. So the 3D information, a lot of information in 3D is collapsed onto a 2D matrix uh, called as the dose volume histogram. The difficult part is that uh, we are going to lose information about uh, the spatial uh, lo location. So we lose all information on the spatial information. There are two types of uh, dose volume histogram, the cumulative and uh, differential. The cumulative one is the most often used or always used uh, the, uh, using cumulative. We look at the target coverage and also what is the dose to the organ set structure. Uh, organ set risk. So these are evaluated using the cumulative DVH. Differential DVH is very rarely used and if at all it is used, it is going to tell us about the dose uniformity within the target. That is the limited use of the differential dose volume histogram. Dose volume histograms are also used in the calculating the tumor control probability and the normal tissue complication probability. And uh, uh, dose volume histograms are also used to, to objectively quantify the quality of dose distribution using various indices that we are going to see. Like for example, if uh, uh, the red color is the PTV and the yellow color is the reference isodose that we are talking about, uh, what we want is a perfect overlap, but that uh, will never happen. So there is always going to be a part of the PTV that is going to be missed and also a part of the reference isodose is going to spill on to the normal tissue. So how much of the PTV that we are missing and how much of the reference isodose is uh, spilling on to the normal tissue. So for different situations, so like this, it can be reference isodose can completely encompass the PTV or reference isodose can completely lie within the PTV. So for all these type of scenarios, we have to evaluate the miss spill and also how the dose is falling off uh, away from the PTV. So we have to know how much of PTV is covered, how much is the spill, how much is the uniformity within the PTV, and how does the dose fall off away from the uh, PTV. So what are the different indices, coverage index that will tell us about the miss, conformity index that will tell us about uh, how is the spillage, and homogeneity and heterogeneity index will tell us about the uniformity of dose within the PTV. And gradient index will tell that how the dose is falling off. So anyone uh, wanting to know more about a conformity index, I would strongly recommend uh, this paper that appeared in the Red Journal in 2006, an excellent uh, review paper, conformity index, because these values can differ according to the source. There are multiple ways of definition of these coverage index, conformity index, and uh, homogeneity index. So you have to be careful about uh, how you are going to use and uh, what kind of results that uh, you will get. The uh, good part is that uh, some of the deficiencies of the indices that we had seen in the previous slide are overcome by this uh, another index called as the conformation number. Uh, we know this mostly as a paddock index. Uh, that paper appeared in 2000, but actually even before 2000, in 1997, this paper appeared in uh, Red Journal. The author is uh, Vant uh, Reard. And uh, it is in that 1997 paper that uh, this particular index uh, that has been, uh, that, that was defined uh, very first. Uh, called as the confirmation number. So different definitions are there for the, uh, the different uh, uh, indices, and it can vary according to whether you are using this RTOG or whatever uh, the uh, uh, definitions that you have uh, accepted. Now, it will be all, instead of uh, talking about uh, different indices, it will make our life easy if we can talk about one single number called as the plant quality index. If we can collapse all information instead of talking about too many indices, if we can collapse all information onto a magic number, we can call it as overall plant score or plant quality index. That can tell everything about uh, uh, the plant. And yes, 
there are commercial solutions available multiple authors have published uh, such type of plan quality in uh, index so here if you look at this you just have one number to know about the plan quality competitions like uh, where the, the planning competitions uh, where they want to compare between the plants they use this type of commercial algorithms including the one that we are going to see in the coming days so uh, the competition uh, is assessed or uh, the plants in the competition are assessed using this plant quality index and uh, the maximum value is 150 and how much a particular plant has uh, scored we can just tell in one number all the criteria are taken into account by weighing the different dose volume spectrum values now one of the last things in the dose metrics is that when you use the plan sum or when you uh, add the different uh, plans situations may vary from simple to not so simple situations phase one phase two phase three will be there phase one modified plan after few fractions but same image phase one adaptive ct phase two phase three see the, there may be simple to not so simple and we may be using multiple image sets and they all warrant a very careful evaluation so they will have inherent uncertainties related to fusion so when you are using the plan sum you have to be careful about all these points and it will be very difficult to evaluate the hot spots because uh, fusion will result in certain uncertainty and in the presence of uncertainty it will be very difficult to evaluate the hotspots you have to uh, consider all the possibilities before you accept a, a plan sum so the planner must narrate everything to treating radiation oncologist at the time of uh, plan uh, evaluation and approval and plan modifications they are quite routinely performed in every clinic Consider every plan modification as a fresh plan. I have come across situations where uh, plan modifications are just like that carried out without any proper instruction or without the proper documentation. That must be completely stopped. That is a very dangerous practice. So consider every plan modification as a fresh plan and everything has to undergo again plan evaluation in the presence of all the team members. Plan sum must be evaluated before a modified plan is accepted and everything should be documented. Now, moving on from the dose metrics, uh, we come to the plan robustness. Uh, what we call by robustness is that in conventional optimization, a single scenario is considered. That is, patient is treated as if uh, the patient is in a fixed nominal position and uh, the optimization is done by considering the PTV and the PRVs. However, in robust optimization, different type of scenarios are considered, incorporating errors to calculate the final dose distribution. So optimization is done based on considering different type of uh, scenarios, error scenarios. It has become a standard tool in proton therapy and uh, it is also gaining interest in photon therapy. Some of the planning systems, uh, uh, photon planning systems are also incorporating uh, this plan robustness into uh, their tools. A plan has to be not only good, but also it has to be robust if it can be safely delivered to the patient. So we have to, the plan has to yield a dose distribution that is suitable for all or majority of the error scenarios. There are two types of approaches. One is the probabilistic approach. So a Gaussian type of error distribution is considered and that is incorporated into the plan evaluation or a mini max situation means that the worst type of uh, error scenario is considered and for that optimization is done and to see whether uh, it is giving a good result or not. See like uh, Eclipse has got uh, this kind of uh, uh, tool for evaluating the plan robustness for different error scenarios it will calculate uh, different plans. You see here like uh, uh, 12 plans with uh, 12 different uncertainties can be calculated. And then uh, you will result in uh, 12 different uh, dose distribution. And then uh, they can be evaluated using the plan uncertainty doses in the dose volume histogram. So this is how it looks like uh, the solid line represents the ideal situation 
but uh, these dotted lines uh, tell us uh, about uh, the different uncertainty uh, taken into different uncertainties taken into account so sometimes it can be good for the oars when the uh, uncertainty is uh, towards the opposite direction of the oar or it can get worse also so the dotted lines tell us about the uh, different uncertainties the last thing is the plan complexity modern delivery techniques involve a lot of modulation of the machine parameters so machine parameters like gantry rotation dose rate everything is modulated so the more amount of uh, modulation that means that uh, there is going to be increase in the plan complexity and that can possibly result in larger uncertainties uh, leading to uncertainties in the dose calculation and also uncertainties in the treatment uh, delivery so it's very challenging to quantify this plan complexity in the good old days uh, they had used fluence maps uh, in order to quantify the plan complexity but uh, uh, that is no more being used and uh, currently the accepted uh, uh, methodologies are degree of the aperture modulation and the irregularity of the beam apertures so these are the two indicators for uh, assessing the plan complexity eclipse has got uh, aperture shape controller in order to reduce or allow highly complex plants it has got certain control uh, called aperture shape controller and also the convergence mode and we in our clinic use a very simple complexity matrix called uh, plan complexity matrix called as the imrt factor it's just nothing but the total mus in the plan for the site divided by dose per fraction in centigrade so that is computed and you can do this for all of your patients and build a database and it can prove to be a good filter to catch outliers for example in prostate plan to deliver 66 gray in 33 fractions which is 200 centigrade per fraction uh, we get 719 mus for a uh, particular patient so i am at a factor how much it is 3.6 uh, 719 divided by 200 that gives uh, 3.6 so like this you can do for several patients and you will uh, arrive at you know that what is going to be your imrt factor so if any particular patient uh, shows a completely different figure you will be able to catch that uh, outliers very easily so to summarize uh, plan evaluation is a very important uh, step in the whole rt treatment delivery chain for the reasons I had already defined, I already told, everyone uh, ensured that everyone talks the same language and everyone is on the same platform so that nothing is mistaken. And you have to understand the TPS tools well, and there are a lot many indices. They are all very valuable in assessing the plan quality, but do get to know about uh, the, uh, the limitations of those indices uh, that you are using. Uh, they may have certain, some limitations. And whenever possible, you have to evaluate the plan's robustness and complexity. And please do not forget about the documentation. Documentation should be complete and comprehensive for each and every plan, phase one, phase two, phase three, and also for even modified plan. Even if you are going to do n number of modifications, every modification should be properly modi uh, documented. Thank you very much, and I will be glad to take any questions if there are uh, any.